Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 293. Postmenopausal women taking metformin for diabetes are also at lower risk for breast cancer. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Moppet and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Moppin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Moppin's office is currently accepting new patients. One of the significant questions that comes up regularly in Dr. Moppin's practice and, and when just talking to women about replacing their lost hormones uh, is the question of in all caps, breast cancer. If you have had breast cancer, if you are susceptible to breast cancer, if you're just afraid that because you're a woman you might get breast cancer, would it be a good thing or a bad thing to consider replacing your hormones? And there's an awesome amount of data that addresses these questions. And Dr. Maupin tries to synthesize that data and put it down to a very hearable message for most of the women that come to see her. So we thought we'd spend some time today talking about the issue of estrogen replacement and breast cancer risks and and what kinds of steps can be taken to give you the best long-term safety to avoid breast cancer. So what do you have to tell us? What can you, what is the question? I always wondered how, how estrogen of any kind got the rap that, Mm -hmm. That it, the Women's it, Health Initiative. Yeah, of, of yeah but before that, it, it got the rap that it, it increased the risk of breast cancer. Well, that's really interesting. It's kind of like the prostate thing. Well, breasts are on women, mm-hmm. and women have estrogen. Right. Men have estrogen, too, so they didn't really think about that. But women have estrogen, so estrogen must cause breast cancer. That's basically where it came from, which in medicine, you know that it's so much more complicated than that, that that's not the case. And sometimes going backwards, when people have breast cancer and they say, oh, I have estrogen receptors, Mm -hmm. then that means that you can't take estrogen. So if if you have receptors receptors for breast, for estrogen on your breast cancer. Oh, okay. So what that means, I mean, if you really think it through is that, yes, we all have receptors on our breast cells. Right. They don't necessarily cause cancer, but once you have a cancer, the estrogen can feed the cancer. So so we don't want to give estradiol in large amounts or any estrogen in large amounts with existing with existing breast cancer who have who have positive estrogen receptors and who have still have breasts. Sometimes women choose to have complete mastectomies. So, so you can test for that. You do the, a, a blood test? You do that No, with, it's a tissue test. A tissue test. When they take the breast cancer out, they test it for receptor, receptor sites. sites. Okay. So if you have an estrogen receptor and we give you estrogen with a breast cancer, mm-hmm. then that could speed Lost. speed the growth. Right. Okay. So we try to we try to block those those estrogen receptors. So we use several drugs to do that. But the progesterone receptors that we look for, progesterone usually slows breast cancers down Mm -hmm. in terms or breast tissue down. It usually calms it down. And on cancers, it speeds it up. So it's it's specific to an already produced cancer. Okay. So there's already one there. The only time estrogen is a risk is if it's there and if it has estrogen receptors. So if you have the receptor sites, but you've not yet developed breast cancer, there really... Well, you have receptor sites on all of your breast tissue. But if you have positive estrogen receptor sites on your breast... No, you can't. You can't have it unless you have cancer. Okay. So, So it's only on cancer tissue. All right. So we're only concerned about estrogen receptors on existing and progesterone on existing cancers, but that doesn't mean that estrogen causes cancer. Right. So it's a, it's an interesting kind of dilemma that you have to actually think through. Well, it's basically the old saw about correlation doesn't equal causation. Right. When it's just a logical thought, oh, women have estrogen, they have breasts, so then mm-hmm. they have breast cancer. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So. So when we look at it that way, we also start looking 
for other things that could cause breast cancer. So in my practice, when I looked at my patients that had breast cancer, who developed breast cancer over time and the ones that didn't, I had actually more people who took nothing, who took no hormones Mm-hmm. And uh, where postmenopausal breast cancer is a different thing than premenopausal, but but they these women took nothing, and there were many more uh, cancers that were in that group than in the women who took estrogen. So, and they were much more severe. So when we look at this and we look at the studies, the studies back that up. That was my view of my practice, but studies actually back that up. And and we were looking at a study that actually backs up something else. Mm -hmm. I I always ask patients, you know, you're so worried about estrogen. Are you worried about your diabetes? Are you worried about your obesity? Are you worried about your alcohol intake? Are you worried about your lack of exercise? Are you worried about all the sugar you eat? And they go, no. Well, those are the risk factors for breast cancer. So you should be worried about that. And those are things you can actually do something about. It's it's like talking to men about prostate cancer. You know, prostate, the the old saw is that if you live long enough, prostate cancer will kill you if something else doesn't first. Mm -hmm. But there are all these other mortal, lethal things that can kill you before you have to worry about prostate cancer. Right. And so you're saying the same thing about breast cancer. If you look at diabetes, if you look at obesity, if you look at smoking or drinking, first, before this all develops, you may go down a different road. You may not have exposure of impetus that leads to the development of breast cancer. Well, a new study shows that if you behaviorally can treat your your diabetes uh-huh. with metformin, which is a, a basic drug, we do this all the time, diabetes or prediabetes with metformin, if you can... Metformin is a drug that you can get a prescription for. Yeah, and it's generic and inexpensive. And you can exercise daily and you decrease the alcohol in your life and you decrease the fat in your life and you lose fat and take testosterone and estrogen, which is a part that we add because that actually does help you prevent uh, getting diabetes or insulin resistance, then you decrease your risk of getting breast cancer. So it's behavioral and medication. So you're saying testosterone and estrogen replacement and metformin, and then behavioral changes. Right, and that's the behavioral it. changes that, that you list for avoiding diabetes are exercise at least 30 minutes a day. Mm-hmm. Eat at regular intervals. And you say between three and six times a day, so you don't eat as much at one time. Mm-hmm. And, and you don't ride the accordion or the roller coaster where mm-hmm. you don't eat all day and then you just eat dinner. Yeah, you that's a really all your calories for the end of the day. Or you bad plan. It, it's better to eat multiple small meals and, and watch your carb intake. Make sure you're getting enough protein. So you, you, you have to think about this mm-hmm. and fresh fruits and green, you know. You can't fruits. emotionally eat. You have to think about it before you eat. Yeah. That so that's, that's will kill you. Yeah. But that's because we emotionally eat sugar. Mm-hmm. So you have to limit your sugar and your carbohydrates. I mean, sugar's in a lot of things. You have to think about it. If it tastes sweet, you got to wonder why. If it's got, if it tastes sweet, it's probably sugar. Yeah. Well, so that you, you should limit no that. No more than 25 grams per, per meal, meal of sugars. Mm-hmm. Of carbs. Of carbs. Mm-hmm. So, to turn into sugar. Right, because that's a, that's the magic number. If you go to 26, your pancreas produces too much insulin. And when it produces too much insulin, it causes hypoglycemia. Eventually you'll become you'll become immune to your insulin called insulin resistance. That means you get high from sugar and you get depressed two hours later or an hour later, depending on your metabolism, then you have to have more sugar, then you go up and down and up and down. That's not good for you, and it leads to diabetes. Well, and you also say to avoid diabetes, if you haven't developed it yet, limit your alcohol intake uh, to mm-hmm. two or three nights a week, a modest amount, mm-hmm. not, not just get saturated. Uh, and if you already have diabetes, then you should avoid alcohol because of the sugars that That's are That's right. That's right. And you're told to do that anyway, but I'm not anybody who listens that I know. Mm-hmm. So... Um, so diet, so here's another kind of nugget. Diabetes increases the risk and severity of many cancers, including endometrial, which is uterine, breast, pancreatic, which is a terrible cancer to get. I have to actually like look at this because I didn't have it. I didn't list. have it committed to memory, and so. Um, Let's see, which cancers were those? Um, oh, colon, 
and uh, lymphoma, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, liver, and we already talked about breast. So mm -hmm. all of those cancers, if you're at risk for those, if you have them in your family history, if you're worried about that, if somebody's told you you need a colonoscopy all the time, like every five years, right. then you're at risk. So you need to watch your blood sugar. I mean, blood eating sugar. Some people go, oh, I can eat all the sugar I want. Well, here's the bad news. If you eat a lot of sugar, I don't care if you can take it or not, and it doesn't cause you diabetes, it feeds cancers. Well, but worse yet, down the line, you'll get diabetes. I've had people that come in and say, that's all I eat. And I'm like, well, then we need to talk. And, it, and it's not like a, a magical marker point. You, one day you don't have it and you're free to roam, and the next day you do have it and you're restricted. These things all build towards a total conclusion. Mm -hmm. And so the more sugars you consume, the more likely it is that you will pass that marker point. Mm -hmm. And so you need to be aware of that and you need to think consciously about it. The hard part for you is the American food industry uh, mm -hmm. has focused so much on corn and the development of corn syrups uh, that are sweet that are additives in almost everything you eat. I mean, it's, it's very difficult to find food that's prepackaged and pre-made that doesn't heavily contain corn syrup. Corn syrup, and so you need to eat fresh, uh, mm -hmm. not prepackaged, and then you can avoid some of that. But you, it would amaze you to look at the ingredients. You should look at the ingredients and see and see and and things you wouldn't even believe it would be in that corn syrup is is a principal ingredient. Well, if you look at the if it's greater than twenty five grams a serving, uh -huh. don't pick it up, and then then you can look at what's in it, but. Usually, there's not a lot of corn syrup in anything with less and than 25 grams of carbs. That's because of the politicians carb. and the agricultural market to stabilize the uh, farmers' incomes, and mm -hmm. the food systems have all just gone to uh, to stabilize the shelf life of a product, uh, to make yeah. it taste good, and disguise it. And, and so you got to stay away from that. So, so here's the numbers, which I found yeah. helpful. So, if you weren't already planning on changing your lifestyle or um, getting your hormones replaced or something, uh, decreasing your, your bottle of wine tonight, then uh, women with diabetes have a 13% higher risk of developing invasive cancer of some kind. Invasive, that means not just pre or it hasn't gone anywhere. Invasive cancer, it's gone everywhere. So those are adult onset diabe diabetics. And that that actually doubles the chance of being diagnosed with the following, cancers. the following cancers. Colon, liver, pancreas, endometrial, and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. All of those risk factors are doubled if you uh, develop diabetes. So if you can avoid diabetes, then you spare yourself that risk. Which means early warning. Mm -hmm. Which means when you go to the doctor and your blood sugar's up a little bit and your triglycerides are high and you're gaining fat, then... You should say, what can I do about this? And if they say diet and exercise, you need to say how, and can you help me with something else? So I use metformin, and here's the good news. Metformin is an old-fashioned diabetic drug, but it's usually the first thing you're put on when you have diabetes. Yeah, long before you move to insulin shots. Yeah, I mean, this is insulin's kind of way down the line and usually in type 1 diabetics. But type, type 2 diabetics usually start with metformin and then they add something else. Maybe Victoza is add to, added to it or there's a ton of new medications that are combined mm -hmm. with metformin. But if you catch it early where your blood sugar is not all the way to diabetes and you're not, your hemoglobin A1C isn't 9 because normal is less than 5.8 or 5.7 on my scale. So if you've gotten it early, then you can actually not get it. You change your lifestyle. You, as I tell my patients, you have to do your part. I'll do mine. So I prescribe metformin. I prescribe it. They, people work their way up to three extended release 500 milligram tablets a day with food. They work their way up because of side effects? Yeah, side effects. They have, like they diarrhea, have an, or stomach diarrhea or stomach, kind of stomach irritability that they, they're not mm -hmm. fond of. So mm -hmm. if you slowly increase the dose, you tend not to have that okay. as you go up in dose. You don't want to start out with with three and of them. So you re you recommend that as a pre-diabetic treatment for anybody that's that their blood sugar numbers are starting to climb mm -hmm. and there's a concern about it mm -hmm. because of the increasing risk factors, that they should start early and they should right. ask their doctors, is it possible to get metformin? And in the old days, maybe 10 years ago, mm -hmm. 
endocrinologist used to call me up and say, why did you put her on diet on metformin? Because she doesn't have diabetes. Doesn't have diabetes. And I'm like, because she has prediabetes and insulin resistance and she's hypoglycemic. Well, that's not a good reason. And, I, you I know, they click. I had a personal physician years ago when I was in my 30s or 40s that told me, because of my family history of diabetes, everybody on both sides dies of that if they don't die of something else. Uh, she said there's no such thing as prediabetes. There's a number, <laughs> and you're on this side of the number, and you don't have it, or you're on this side of the number, and you do have it. If you're on this side of the number, these are things we're going to do to treat you. Well, see, there's a lot of doctors who are who were picked because they're rule followers. But that makes no sense physiologically. No, and it didn't to me uh, in terms <laughs> of to an you, explanation of yeah. rationality. You know, like, well, is it really that magical? You just cross a threshold and boom, you're going to die? <laughs> okay. <laughs> it slowly, slowly happens. And so you have so to I consider need, I need that. I some sugar. I got to go out and get something to feel better. <laughs> Over my dead body. <laughs> so so really, met, then they found when they were, they were looking at this study of the risk factors for breast cancer, the risk factors for other cancers, and the risk factors for diabetes were all the same. So then they looked at the risk of having diabetes and getting cancers, and that's where they came up with the numbers. Mm -hmm. So it was studies. They did all this research, but it's also somewhat logical thought. You have to put it all together. But when, when, <laughs> when the risk factors for three different things mm -hmm. are the same... It'll then, come in all caps. Hello, warning. Right, right. Then, then you should be able to make that leap that somebody with diabetes has a higher risk of getting cancers of all types. So the good news is if you take metformin and you're diabetic and you're pre-diabetic, then that decreases your risk down to almost normal. So in the blog that we wrote about this that will also be posted with, with the website, you make a statement. My experience is that women who do get breast cancer while on estradiol and testosterone pellets for more than two years get very low-grade treatable cancers that do not take their life. That's talk true. a little bit about that because, again, I want to go back to the fear of breast cancer. We're trying to talk about the correlation between all of these illnesses that warn you that something's wrong, you need to do something about it, and that if you don't, it could kill you. But let's go back to the fear of breast cancer as it relates to hormone replacement. So... My patients said, I, I always, I mean, it may be partly how I do it, but I, I use estrogen non-orally. I don't use Premarin and I don't use estradiol orally. I always use a, a trans, in the old days, transdermal vaginal tabs, sublinguals for estrogen at least. Mm -hmm. And now I use pellets, which is also, is non-oral and much superior to any of the other forms of uh, delivery systems for estrogen. So it may be partially how I use estrogen, However, I also always use testosterone, and testosterone decreases prediabetes, decreases your risk of prediabetes, decreases weight, decreases fat. I mean, it actually changes all of these Metabolic. risk factors metabolically. Right. So because I give testosterone with estradiol, then I find that I have fewer patients get breast cancer. I mean, it should stand... It, sh it should be that my patient population, which is high, high risk because they're all over 40, I mean, except right. one or two, they're all over 40, and they're, many of them are over 50, so they're in a, every year that you get older, you're in a higher risk, right. yet they have a lower rate in our practice of getting breast cancer than, any, than people other populations anywhere other else. Yeah. So... But, but besides that, when they get it, because anyone with a breast can get breast cancer, right? So when they do get breast cancer, it's very treatable, rarely in the nodes, rarely has it been an aggressive, like high, um, a high rank on the um, ag aggressive scale that they give you. I don't even go into that anymore because I don't. I don't interpret the, the mammograms and, and send people to breast surgeons anymore. I just, I just have that as information their primary does or their gynecologist does. But I get all the data and all the information from them about what's going on. And usually what happens is we st if they have estrogen receptors in the cancer, we stop giving estrogen, but we continue testosterone. And that actually helps them recover from all of this. Mm -hmm. And it improves their immune system so that they can fight cancer cells. So my practice is, is a microcosm, 
but it's not typical. It's not the uh, a normal GYN practice where everybody's going here, take this pill. I mean, it, it may not have the same numbers or outcomes as everybody else, but it does show that when we are preventing, I mean, we're preventing symptoms of menopause and symptoms of um, testosterone deficiency. We're also preventing aggressive breast cancers. But at the end of the day, what, what you say to everybody is that these things are not individually predictive and you do individual medicine. There's not just mm -hmm. a global panacea. You know, here are three things that you do. You replace your testosterone, your estrogen, and you take metformin. Uh, those are options that increase your safety net, mm -hmm. but it all depends on the metabolism and the behavioral aspects mm -hmm. of each individual patient, which is mm -hmm. why you need a doctor-patient relationship. Somebody mm -hmm. that knows you, knows your history, knows your predilections, mm -hmm. and can help structure a program of weight loss, exercise, and hormonal treatment that maximize your chances of living better, healthier, disease-free for longer. That's our goal. And we give you guidelines, so, but that you. is all they are. <laughs> so remember and that you when you to talk your to your part. doctor. Yeah. yeah. Thank you Thank very you. much. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.